If you're new to this channel, you may consider subscribing and hit the bell icon so that you continue to receive the updates. Please share it with all others who might benefit. Let's get started. Hello and welcome. In the sequence of videos, we begin to talk about a very important statistical concept that's known as correlations. We will be talking about different types of correlation. Generally, when we talk about correlation, it's considered to be Pearson's correlation by default. But depending on the data type, we may have to apply different types of correlations. So we'll talk about correlation as a general idea, and then we'll talk about different types of correlations, which are very useful while working on a data. So let's first understand what is a correlation. Correlation is a statistical measure used to quantify the strength of association between two variables. If both the variables move in the same direction, that is, if an increase or decrease in one variable corresponds to an increase or decrease in the other variable, then the correlation is said to be positive. However, if the two variables move in the opposite directions, the correlation is said to be negative. Let's understand this with the help of visual examples. So let's say we have two variables, x and y, and in this case, we are trying to demonstrate a positive correlation, which means as the variable x increases, the y also increases. Something like this would be visible. So you can see the x-axis where the variable is increasing from zero to one. And on the y-axis, there's another variable that's increasing from a zero to 1.8. The numerical values are not important. What's important is, are they moving in the same direction? As x increases, y also increases. If that's the case, then we are talking about a positive correlation. Likewise, to understand the negative correlations, it simply means as x increases, the y would be decreasing. And to see it visually, this is how it looks like. So in this case, you can see as x increases from zero to one, y is decreasing from one to negative 0.75. So this is leading to a decrease in the y variable as x increases. That's why the relationship is negative. Now let's talk about the most popular type of correlation. It's almost synonymous with the name of correlation. When you say correlation, a lot of people would have this in mind. That's Pearson's correlation. What does a Pearson's correlation look like and what does it capture? So it's denoted by a symbol that's lowercase r, is a numerical measure of the linear relationship between the variables x and y. Important here is to note, we are talking about a linear relationship. And that's something which we need to emphasize all the time when we are interpreting Pearson's correlation. Now this R is calculated as a ratio of covariance of x and y divided by the standard deviation of x and standard deviation of y. In a basic statistics course, you have already studied about variance and standard deviations. So when it comes to one variable, we talk about variance. When it comes to two variables, paired variables, we talk about covariance. So Pearson's correlation is a scaled form of covariance. And if we simplify, if we put the values of covariance and the standard deviations in this formula, we'll end up getting something like this. So this is a simple formula for calculating the Pearson's correlation coefficient. We'll show you an example in some time where we'll perform these calculations. Now the xi and yi values here represent every single data point, paired observations, and x bar and y bar represent the averages of these two variables. Let's move on to discuss the properties of Pearson's correlation coefficient. So the first property of the Pearson's correlation coefficient is that it always ranges from negative one to positive one, plus one. And both values could be inclusive. When the value is exactly equal to one, we can say there's a perfect positive correlation between x and y. When this value is equal to negative one, we can say there's a perfect negative correlation between x and y. And when this value is zero, the two variables x and y are called uncorrelated variables. But these are extreme cases. To just get an exact one or an ex exact negative one or zero is an extreme possibility. You often would have these values in a range. And broadly speaking, the range lies between negative one to one. Now what we call a strong or weak or moderate relationship depends a lot on the context as well, but we'll give you some broad guidelines as to how the correlation coefficients are supposed to be interpreted. So generally, if the value of R is greater than 0.8 positive, we can say there's a high degree of positive correlation. If this value is less than negative 0.8, we can say there's a high degree of negative correlation. In general, you can refer to this table. So if the absolute value of R, this Pearson's correlation coefficient, is less than or equal to 0.3, it's considered to be a weak correlation. If this value of R is less than or equal to 0.8, it's considered to be a moderate correlation. And if the absolute value of R is greater than 0.8, which means it could be positive or negative in terms of absolute value, it's considered to be a strong correlation. Now, like I said, 
this depends a lot on the context as well. When you're studying psychology and social behavior, a relationship to the extent of 0.5 or 0.6 could be considered a strong correlation. But when you're dealing with machines and systems which are pretty deterministic, then even a 0.8 could be just an okayish correlation. You may be looking for even better correlations. So this is just a broad guideline, how to interpret the Pearson's correlation coefficient. Now let's move on to a generic example with respect to varying values of the correlation strength. So we can look at this picture now. It tries to depict visually what a strong or moderate or weak correlation means. So when we talk about a strong positive correlation, we are referring to a scenario where if we try to fit a line between X and Y, these points will be pretty close to the line. Perfect one would mean that all these points are on the line. But if the points are pretty close to the line, it indicates that the correlation is strong. When we talk about a moderate positive correlation, we are talking about the points being somewhat close, but not as close as you had in case of a strong positive correlation. And when we talk about a weak positive correlation, the points are relatively more apart. So is the case with negative correlations. A strong negative correlation would mean that the points are sloping downwards. If you try to fit a line between X and Y, which is called a regression line, you would see that the points are relatively closer to this line. And as we move on to the moderate and weak options, the points keep distancing themselves from the line. So this in a nutshell is the summary of graphical representation, depending on the degree of association between the variables. Another very important property of Pearson's correlation is that it's independent of change of origin and scale. What does it mean? So by default, we assume that the origin is zero, zero. In coordinate geometry, that's what we follow. But even if you shift the origin to another point and you modify the values, let's say you multiply a value with a certain factor or divide it by a certain factor, the correlation coefficient remains unaffected. We will demonstrate this in the hands-on piece as well. The correlation is independent of origin and scale. This is a very important property of Pearson's correlation. Next, we move to the hands-on section where we'll try to manually calculate the correlation coefficient and also see how this works in Python. But let's just understand what the example like. So we have two variables with us, sunlight exposure and vitamin D. In general, it is believed that if you have a good exposure to sunlight, your vitamin D levels would be intact. So ideally, we expect a positive correlation between these two variables, but we'll check for the given case, what does it look like? So we have some data. These are 10 observations of sunlight and vitamin D levels. And now we are going to check if there is a positive correlation, is that a strong correlation or a moderate or a weak correlation? We'll interpret that as well. Now for correlations, first thing that's very important to check is that do we actually visually see a linear association or not? Why is that important? If you remember the definition of Pearson's correlation, it talks about quantifying the linear relationship between the variables. So if the variables are not linearly associated to begin with, there is no point checking Pearson's correlation. In fact, we'll talk about this separately as well in some time, but for the time being, we visually see that the two variables, if we say sunlight on the x-axis and the vitamin D levels on the y-axis, they seem to be linearly associated. So now we move on to calculating the average values for x and y. x is the sunlight exposure and y is vitamin D. To get the average, we have to add all the numbers and then we have to divide it by the counts. So for x, variable, we get the average as 25. And for y, it's approximately 27 or 28. We'll take it as 27 in this example and proceed with the calculations. So here's our data. Here's the table where we are going to perform certain operations. We have x and y raw values here. We first have to subtract the average of the x from every single observation. So it's kind of an xi minus x bar. That's what we are doing here. We do that and then we do a sum total. In this case, the sum total, because of the positive negative signs, comes out to Z. Then we do a y minus y bar, which means subtract the average of y, which was 27, from every single value of y, and we get a sum total, which is 6. Now, for every single row, we have to do a x minus x bar squared. So when we do that, we get these values, and the sum of all these x minus x bar squared values added up is 368. Similarly, the sum of all the y minus y bar squared values added up is 334. And then we also do a product between x minus x bar and y minus y bar. So when we do this, we get the numbers like this. Next, we're going to use these values in the formula. So to recollect, this was our formula. So we have to do a summation of xi minus x bar multiplied by yi minus y bar in the numerator. And in the denominator, we have the square root of sum of squared values of xi minus x bar and yi minus y bar. We have all these pieces captured in the previous table. We just have to plug those here. And if we simplify this, 
we'll get the answer, which is approximately 0.91. Now, if you remember, anything above 0.8 is generally considered to be a strong correlation. And in this case, the value is actually greater than 0.9. So this is a strong positive correlation. That's what we can say. Now, let's say if we have to perform the same calculation in Python, how would we do that? So, of course, we'll have to give the data as the input, but the calculations would not be done manually. There would be methods available in Python libraries, like NumPy, even in Pandas, we have methods which calculate correlations directly. So, in this case, we are going to use the NumPy library of Python. We are importing it as NP, and then we have an array. These are the same values that we saw in the raw data earlier. So, these are the values of sunlight, and these are the values of vitamin D. And then we are using NumPy's correlation coefficient method, giving the inputs as sunlight and vitamin D, and just printing out the Pearson's correlation coefficient. You can see the value that we calculated manually was 0.91. And in this case, again, the value that we get is exactly 0.91. So it's very simple. We just have to apply the right method and we'll be able to get a result. In case you're wondering, why did we use this 0, 1 here? Let me show you just the correlation calculation and you'll see that the output of this entire NP correlation coefficient is actually a matrix. It's a two-dimensional matrix. So zero, one represents the row zero and column index one. We could get it like this, or we could have also written one comma zero, which is the row with index one and column with index zero. That's one and the same thing. The correlation matrix would be symmetric. So this is just the indexing on the correlation matrix, but you get the identical value. Now let's move on to discuss the key assumptions behind Pearson's correlation, and these are very important. Without satisfying the assumptions related to correlations, we will not be able to get the right interpretation. So let's understand these. First of all, there has to be a linear relationship between the two variables. This is a primary prerequisite. Second is that the data from both variables should follow a normal or nearly normal distribution. We should not have the outliers present in the data. That's the third assumption because when you have outliers present in the data, they may distort the normality of the data. Fourth is that the observation should be independent. So each XY pair that we are considering has no connection. These are independent observations. And lastly, the data that we are measuring should be captured at least on an interval or a ratio scale. So there are different scales at which the data is measured. So there is nominal where there is no interpretation of a number as such. Then we have ordinal where we talk about an order between the values. Then comes the interval and ratio. So for correlations, it's recommended that data should be continuous in nature and should be at least interval or ratio scale data. Next, we'll be talking about why correlations should not be interpreted as causation. A word of caution related to correlations is that we should not interpret correlation as causation. This simply means if two variables are correlated, it does not mean that one variable causes the other. Correlation measures the strength and direction of a linear relationship between two variables. Causation implies cause and effect kind of relationship between the two variables. A correlation between unrelated variables would generally not imply causation because the relationship might be just a coincidence. Let's understand this with the help of an example. Let's say we are trying to study a correlation between children's ability to read and their shoe size. Now it is quite possible on an average you may observe that the children with larger shoe sizes tend to achieve higher reading scores. But are we trying to say that it's the larger shoe size that causes the reading ability to improve? Could there be a connection like that? The answer is no. Why? Because there could be many other factors that play a role. For example, how the age is changing. As the child is growing, the child would begin to read better. And of course, the entire body grows, so the feet would also grow. So shoe size and reading ability are not causing each other. It's another factor that's driving both. In the next video, we'll talk about a very important study that's done on correlations that's known as the ANSCOMS Quartet. Okay, so we'll talk about ANSCOMS Quartet now. This is a very interesting study carried out in the year 1973 by a scientist by the name of Francis ANSCOM. And this is still data, very important study whenever it comes to interpreting correlations. The interesting part is that there were four different data sets that were collected. These data sets had identical descriptive characteristics. For example, if you had a pair of X and Y, the X bars and Y bars of all the four data sets were identical. Their variance was identical. Their extent of correlation and linear association was also identical. Now, these are the four data sets that were collected. And like we discussed, the X bar, Y bar values for all these data sets, their standard deviations for X, Y in all the four cases were identical. Because of this, the Pearson's correlation coefficient for all these four data sets was found to be one and the same. That was 0.816, which is a strong positive correlation. 
Now, just looking at the Pearson's correlation coefficient, can we say that we have an evidence of linear association or it is the other way? Let's try to inspect these data sets visually. So here's a visual representation of the four data sets that we just discussed. This has been obtained from Wikipedia. And if you see, in this case, we can say there is somewhat a linear pattern. We can try to fit a line. Not all the points are exactly on the line, but we have a positive relationship. In the second case, the second data set does not really justify a line because this simply represents a curve. So we should not be force fitting a line in this case. The third case, all these points were heading in a particular direction except for this one point here. And this one point is trying to pull the line towards itself. That's why the slope of the line changes. And that's where we say correlations are sensitive to the presence of outliers. Look at the fourth example. This line was almost a line parallel to y-axis. There's no point other than this one point which has a different value of x. All the other points have the same value of x, so all these points were parallel to y-axis. But because of this one point, we are able to fit a line like this. So in all four cases, you have the same equation of a regression line or same Pearson's correlation coefficient, but it does not mean the variables are linearly associated. The way we should approach it is the other way. We should first visually check if the variables exhibit a linear relationship, then it's wise to interpret the correlation coefficient. That's pretty much about the Pearson's correlation.